And let me just make sure I have all the buttons pressed and recording and all that stuff like that. So cool. And I have to cough, so I'm going to hit the mute button for a second. You're fine. I'm trying to get up. I'm trying. I'm getting over a cold right now, so I'm like, oh. Uh oh. So hopefully that won't happen a lot. So cool. Uh, yeah, again, thanks for, for being on the show. And um, I wanted to have you on the show for a while, actually. So uh, let's talk about uh, um, your, your role over at uh, Treehouse, but also um, what you're working on right now, the, the game development project that you're they're working on. And yeah, um, so with that, but, uh, but we always ask the question is, uh, how did you get involved in the web? What was your first exposure to the web? And uh, what made you decide to focus a lot of stuff on, on, on the web initially um you know i think when i was it was like when i was 10 or 11 years old mm -hmm. i remember being exposed to to front page and uh i liked it because it was this tiny part of my life that i could exert some kind of control over <laughs> um i i my dad was doing uh, some stuff with with front page. He he's done quite a lot of uh, web stuff, um, and he showed me that I can drag out a table and start putting images in it, and that's that's how I was able to lay out my site. And um, when I saw that, I was like, "This is pretty cool. I uh, I can make a website the way I want to make it." Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was around then that I first got exposed to it, and it what like that wasn't really the moment where I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely what I'm gonna right. do for a career. It was um, sort of just a, a parallel thread um, that it that was there for a long time, and I kind of just did it off and on um, until I got a little bit more serious about it, and probably in college. So what what websites were you building? At 10, 11 years old. Um, so I, uh, I remember I was 11 and, and I remember that because, um, my mom showed me an article in the newspaper and, uh, a, another kid had created the 10 year old page and I thought, oh my gosh, my career's over. Uh, <laughs> I've been be beaten by one year. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I was, I was just. You know, it was really kind of just like a personal website. Right. Um, I, I think I put up like my own strategies for games I was playing at the time. Um, I put up like pictures of the family dog. Uh, you know, it was kind of just all the things that are going on in the mind of an 11 year old, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Like, because when I teach uh, the basics, like, of, a web design and stuff. It's really hard for some people who don't have that computer background to grasp. And I always, I always tell them to uh, pick up uh, a hobby or some sort of passion that they like to and build a web page for that because it's it's a lot easier when you're designing content that you love. And then because you still have, you have the hurdle of learning technology and even the basic things like file names and folder structures, you know, that they probably weren't ever exposed to. So, but I was just. I was yeah. because like most people I talk to, it's uh, they build their websites for for bands they like. <laughs> so yeah, 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 that that's pretty common. So yeah. you know, it's interesting you mentioned folder structures uh, because in just the past couple of years, that's actually something that we've had to focus a little bit more on at Treehouse. Yeah, um, and I've so I've been teaching at Treehouse for six years now, and when I first started. You know, we we taught basic front end stuff, and I I don't know files and folders never really came up a whole lot uh, as a specific standalone topic. And as the years went on, um, you know, we made lots more courses. The company grew. We refreshed some of the first courses we did, uh, actually several times. Uh, we built a forum and something that kept coming up in the forum was uh was students that didn't know where they saved files mm -hmm. they said i saved my index.html i don't know where where it is and i'm like how do you not know where this is like i, I couldn't figure it out I was, I was like what like 
what are we doing wrong here? Because it kept coming up over and over and over, like it started getting more frequent. And I finally figured out, you know, that a lot of students don't have exposure to the file system. And I was like, yeah, I mean, what, when would they? Uh, because Facebook is just kind of in the browser or like an app on your phone and right. that's how you listen to music. It's just all on like Spotify or something. And mm. it, you know, they didn't have the same experience I did of stealing music off of Napster <laughs> and organizing all of it into nice files and folders. Right. That's, that's how I learned growing up. Uh, so I was like, yeah, wow, that makes total sense. Uh, files and folders are actually starting to become, a little bit more of a programmer y thing. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Aside, it, but yeah, that, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. It's, it was, because, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it comes an issue because cause I taught uh, at my college, my alma mater for a while, and then I taught online for a while. And it was always a hard thing because, because uh, you're, you're, you're kind of distance yourself when you teach online. And you're trying to teach someone like, hey, file names and file structures, and if they're not exposed to it, and especially with the iOS devices, when they don't need to be worried about file names and structures, like you just said, it was just like, um, and subscriber services where you're not really owning the content anymore, right? You, it's not like a Blu-ray disc, like you were like, hey, I'm putting it into a, a folder, you know? It's like, or your email, because your email is, just, you know, with Gmail, it's always archived somewhere, you know? It's always yep. in the cloud, so you don't have to. It never disappears. So, and so when you're trying to tell someone like, no, you have to be very specific about where you're pulling this from. They're like, why? Like, why? Like, well, that's computers. That's how they work. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. But yeah. So yeah. So how did you patch that up, or like how how you address it? Well, I mean, when we were going through another another round of uh, course refreshes. Uh, I saw it coming up more and more frequently. I mean, we didn't let it blow up into a massive problem, but I was like, okay, this is like something we're going to need to actually talk about uh, in the course. Another solution uh, we came up with that addressed a number of problems, that one included, uh, is what we call workspaces, which is basically um, it's it's a text editor in the browser, but it it's also more than that uh, because you know you can spin up servers, uh, get access to the console. Um, behind the scenes, you're basically spinning up a, a virtual machine when you open up um, a treehouse workspace, um, and you know it's a, it's all contained and secure and stuff. Um, we've we had a few instances in the past where we discovered things <laughs> after the fact, but it's pretty patched up at this point. Um, but uh, but that helped solve it a little bit um, in the more beginner courses. And eventually, you know, we like students to to kind of graduate to uh, running running things locally and you know stuff like that. But um, that kind of gets over the initial hurdle of like just getting started with html um things like that yeah cool yeah, yeah i think a virtual machine that, that's a pretty smart uh, solution for that so, yeah. cool and then um so students and then uh, what type of games were you, were you playing uh because you said you you, you uh, built web pages for for strategies for games <laughs> yeah um it was real-time strategy games, uh, so pretty much the Blizzard games at the time. Oh. So Warcraft and Starcraft um, okay. were the ones I was super duper into. Gotcha. Growing up, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, and then um, um, what was your first, I guess, job dealing with web? Uh, my first job yeah. uh, was as just self-employed, basically. I, um, you know, it was all like all the most horrible stuff you don't want to do. So just like no contracts, no nothing. I was like 14 or 15 years old. Uh, just over the summer, I was like, yeah, I know some people that need websites and logos and things and just kind of, <laughs> um, yeah, just, just started doing that. And then I guess professionally, um, it'd probably be 
while I was still in college, I, uh, I got an internship at a healthcare consulting firm and that ended up turning into a, a full-time job. So there I was writing PHP and it was for this database that had, um, millions and millions of records, all, you know, a lot of it containing sensitive HIPAA data. So we always had to be very careful about that um, because uh, that's there's pretty strict requirements around right. that. Like if you have one slip up, it's pretty much the end of the company. <laughs> so um, so that was, that was a good first exposure to like real code, I guess, because I... I mean, when I first came in for like the first week, I was thinking about just just quitting and telling my boss saying like, you know what, I'm sorry to waste your time. I'm in way over my head here. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then after like a month or two, I realized it was actually just the code that was really awful. Oh, really? Not my, you know, my lack of understanding. <laughs> and, and so I was like, okay, so that is what my job is here really is about oh, wow. is is untangling this mess and so by the time i left there um we had done a pretty good job of getting it object oriented um mm -hmm. we transferred a lot of software over to ruby on rails because that was kind of the the new hotness at the time mm -hmm. um where, where were you at this time like what, what geographically was, yeah what was college you, you said like so i went to school uh, at UCF, so UCF. the University of Central Florida okay. in Orlando. Go Knights. That's, yeah, that's right. Um, that's where I, I currently live. I still am in Orlando. So I've been in Orlando about 10 years. Um, okay. But I, I grew up in uh, Clearwater, Florida. Oh, okay. so, nice. Yeah, so didn't go far. Um, went, to, went to Orlando and then, yeah, got a job out of, out of school well, while I was still in school and just kind of Stuck around because it was convenient, yeah. low cost of living. I like, you know, not having snow. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I, I lived in Orlando for a while. It was, it's pretty nice. It's very nice. So, um, yeah, I used to uh, work for a company called Mind Comet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah. And then, um, um, so, worked for a healthcare company. Uh, PHP, real Rails, object oriented. So, what was your next uh, uh, gig, uh, gig after that, or job? With that? Next thing after that was was Treehouse. Treehouse. Okay. Yeah. So, I have a question for you. Is that sure? How long were you at the healthcare uh, job Ex before, before? Exactly you? three years to the day. Three years to the day. And yeah. then, what you doing? Um, doc type videos, or were they called doc type at the time? Yes. Yes, yes I was. So. Yeah. So yeah, the, you know. And what was Doctype? So people who don't know. Yeah, so Doctype was a video podcast where each week we would teach a web design topic and a web development topic, and I did it with my buddy Jim Hoskins, and we did that for I think about a year and a half. Um, and basically, we started it while we were at this healthcare company because um, we we wanted to do something together. I mean, we, we met each other, uh, actually in college, uh, at the game developers club. Oh, wow. So we, we, we met there cause we both wanted to make video games and then we realized that's really hard. And so we <laughs> got into more web stuff, um, pretty quickly there, but, but yeah, so we had a podcast, um, but that wasn't the first thing we did. We actually started a company because we wanted to do uh, well, we wanted to do something together. We wanted to collaborate somehow. So we, we started the company thinking we would do client work. So we started, you know, just seeking out clients and, you know, doing really small projects that we thought we could manage while going to school, while having our internships. And, um, we realized we kind of hated it. We didn't like dealing with clients and that wasn't really something that, we wanted to do all the time and so so we were like okay so we would, we don't want to do that so we'll make apps we'll have this suite of apps just like 37 signals which is now known as Basecamp, of course and you know they had all their apps and were very prolific bloggers and and all that so we we're like yeah we're gonna we're gonna make these apps and 
uh, we're going to just collect monthly recurring revenue and everything's just going to be perfect. Uh, it'll be really easy. <laughs> really um, easy. Okay. Yeah. So we, we built uh, uh, like one or two different things to completion, um, or at least very close to completion. And by the time we got to the end of it, uh, so, so one of them was like home inventory software. Because my dad's an accountant, and so my dad was always harping on me about like making sure you know I'm I'm insured with everything, and I you know all my ducks are in a row. And he's like, oh, you really should get insurance for your stuff, or your you know for this, that, and the other. And I was like, I can't catalog all my stuff. This is ridiculous. Like, how am I ever going to do that? So it's like, you know, I bet we could make this home inventory app, make it really easy for people to inventory all of their. Uh, physical belongings right. and then we could uh either have ads on the service or have it be a paid thing or the one i was most interested in was partner partnering with insurance companies uh, kind of in the same way that mint has like credit card offers and things like that right, right. um so anyway we got pretty far with that it was pretty cool it had some interesting features um and when we were about to release it, we were like, do we really want this to be like potentially the next like five years of our lives where we're running this home inventory software thing and answering customer support and, you know, the database goes out and then what? And, you know, we we're just like, I don't think this is really what we want to do. I and mean, we didn't spend a ton of time on it, uh, maybe like three to six months or something, but certainly a good learning experience. But anyway, after all that, we were like, okay, well, we've learned a lot. Maybe we can uh, teach some of the things we've learned to other people. And uh, this was around the time where video blogging was kind of st just starting to pick up traction. It was around like 2008, 2009. Um, and of course, Gary V or G Gary Vaynerchuk had uh, his, his show uh, on Wine Library and he like, really influenced influenced us a lot we're like yeah we should do video blogging because that's you know that that'll be really cool so we started doing that and um that was pretty much what got us the job at uh, treehouse which actually back then was called think vitamin uh it was think vitamin membership think vitamin was the blog and you can already start to see why we rebranded to a totally different <laughs> name because it's it's really confusing to explain anyway um so we, uh, yeah, we did that and, um, we were starting to get some sponsorships and stuff. It was going pretty well. We were thinking about kind of doing like a paid version of it or, you know, we weren't really sure exactly what we were doing, but, um, uh, then we got in touch with, uh, with Ryan Carson and at the time he was running his events business. Um, so he had, you know, future web design, future web apps, um, stuff like that. And he had his, his business carsonified and we were going to these events on the dime of the healthcare company. And, uh, we were going to the one in Miami. It was future, I think it's like future web apps or future web design. I can't remember which one. Um, and it was in, February of 2010 and we were doing our podcast doc type and we uh, we emailed Ryan and we were like hey can we come interview some of your speakers like that would be really great for our podcast and he was like yeah of course whatever yeah, sure like and he they actually set us up in a little press room and I was like this is super cool um, and so we we did that and that's how we first met Ryan and um and then, you know, a couple months go by, and in May of 2010, he, he tweeted that he was looking for a designer and a developer that could do screencasts. Mm -hmm. And I just, I emailed Jim right away. I was like, dude, this is us. Like, we already have a ton of episodes to prove that we can do this on video. Um, so, yeah, so we emailed Ryan, and he was like, oh, man, I thought you were, like, super successful or whatever already and we're like no <laughs> we're, we're just you know just got our first jobs out of college here like we're um so we uh 
uh yeah i, I don't know i mean i guess that's the rest cool. is history as they say well, that's kind of cool it's like kind of a, it's kind of interesting how perceptions are are different online to different people so totally sure yeah, that's cool. all right and so that's how that's how it all started right yeah all right. yeah that's how trios got started it was just jim and i in orlando and ryan it was in the uk actually mm-hmm. and he he lived there for about 10 years until he moved back to the united states and he's in portland oregon now but uh but yeah for the first six months it was just the three of us and a few different contract folks and so pretty much every day jim and i would um write a video and uh shoot it and and upload it so there'd be two new videos every day um which was kind of insane looking back i don't know how we did that um Uh, but yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of hustle. Um, and yeah, then the company kind of started to pick up momentum because actually at the time, so this is a funny story at the time, um, you know, I, I had a pretty steady job in healthcare, right. And had like 401k and of course health insurance since it's a healthcare company and all, all that, all the niceties. Right. And, and I saw this opportunity and Ryan was basically like, well, we're going to try it out for three months. And if things don't work out, like I'll help you guys get a job somewhere else. Like, and I trusted that because, uh, of course Ryan had his events business and, uh, and had lots of great connections. So I was like, yeah, we could just like get a, a job at like Facebook or something, you know, right. um, so I was like, this this seems like a, a good roll of the dice for just being out of school. Um, and like I said, my dad was an is an accountant, and he uh, he was very much against this idea. Yeah, he was like, this is you know, this is not good. This is could this seems like a risk. I don't know. And, and I just kind of went went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah. Well, well, it sounds like any, any parent really. Yeah, 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 sure, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, about a year into Treehouse, uh, my my dad uh, got laid off from his, the bank he was working at, mm-hmm. um, and he was kind of like, "Gosh, I don't know what uh, what I should do." I'm kind of he was kind of considering early retirement or like a part time job or or something. And that same week, Ryan came to me and and or or came to all of us and said, "Hey, do you, do you guys know anybody uh, that is a really experienced accountant but could work like part time?" Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> and I just I turned to everybody in the office that day. I was like, "Should I work with my dad? Do, do you think?" <laughs> I, I was like, "Yeah, I kind of owe it to him for you know raising me." Yeah. Uh, so. I, I was like, yeah, it, it sounds fine. I mean, I, I love my dad; he's great. And, and so I, um, I, I said, yeah, I, I know somebody, and and he's been at the company ever since, like, like five years now. So that's awesome. Yeah. So he he thought it wasn't a good idea, and now he works there too. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, well, it's also our industry is so new. It's just like uh, I remember so many stories with uh, my relatives and they're like, like I, I love the web, I love web design and I want to go do this thing. And it's like, well, why? <laughs> just like, it's like, right. well, it's it just seems kind of like a fad. Like, like I, don't, I don't think so. I think it's going to be here for a while. So, but yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so uh, yeah, play a story like that and it's just, but, uh, but if you, I don't know, it's like a, if you, if you love what you do, you just gotta take the take the leap. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, so, definitely. And that's our moral for today, guys. Everyone who's listening, it's just like, yep, just take it. <laughs> so just uh, do it. Just do it. <laughs> All right, um, cool. And um, so that's that's how your treehouse and um, uh, treehouse is awesome. So just uh, doing that. But I also want to talk to you today about games. And since we talked so far, you've Games have been pretty pretty important part of your life. Yeah, so. like like I said, I mean, it's there. There's a lot of different 
threads, I think, in, in anybody's life. And right. and that's kind of how games have been for me. Is I, I've always loved playing games. I mean, I remember playing a, when I was a little kid, like four or five years old, um, I would play on our IBM PC. And my, so we didn't have internet at, at home yet at the yeah. time and but my dad had internet at the bank mm -hmm. so every day my my dad would like you know this was kind of like the shareware era and so he would download like some kind of thing uh, you know and bring it home on a floppy disk and every day when my dad would come home and say hey dad did you get like any new games today mm -hmm. and, and you know he he was great he, he, he always had something um so he he must have enjoyed it too, but uh, I remember experiencing like I, I remember being like five years old and playing like Wolfenstein and and Doom. Oh, yeah. Wolfenstein I mean, 3D. Oh yeah, oh, and yeah. and you know this was before the ESRB and any kind of rating system, right? So it was probably like horribly inappropriate <laughs> for five year old. But I was like, wow, this is great. Um, and uh, yeah, I I just. So that was kind of, I think, the first exposure to it that I really remember. And uh, we were kind of a Nintendo household, so I remember growing up with an SNES and mm -hmm. N64 and stuff. Um, when I got to college, I I waited in line for two and a half days for Nintendo Wii. <laughs> yeah, that, that happened. So you, uh, but you never went to a computer store that was looked like it was a hole in the wall uh, in a strip mall. So and, and they had like uh their video games were on floppy disks. In like the Ziploc bags. Yeah. Uh no, so we ne <laughs> I never went to a computer store like that, but I did we did go to computer shows, okay. uh, which was like a thing at the time. Um and yeah, so there it would be at like some Floridian hotel or something. Uh, and and they would have like this expo hall of like all things computers. They'd be selling like joysticks and all this stuff. And I remember that's where we bought Myst. Uh, mm. Like you know, there there weren't a whole lot of CD-ROM games at the time, and uh, but that was like the one, right? Yeah. Every, everybody was raging about. And so uh, we we got that. And yeah, I remember buying lots of games that way. At the, those computer shows. Um, so that, that was always. Always a fun thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, after that, I uh, I guess it was in college, like I said, I, I joined the uh, the Game Developers Club. And that, that is where I met Jim. And we, we ended up working at the healthcare company together and um, doing doc type and stuff. Um, but I joined the Game Developers Club and uh, I didn't really know a whole lot about programming at the time. Um, you know, I'd done, I've like messed around in front page and done some HTML stuff, but I like really hadn't done any actual if statements and logic and things before. And so um, I, I wasn't a whole lot of use to the Game Developers Club at, at first anyway. And, and so I went back to my dorm one night and I was like, all right, I really got to just like buckle down and learn this stuff. And so I, I, I bought, um, I bought C for dummies and C plus plus for dummies. And I read, I read both those books cover to cover and, um, you know, just kind of absorbed it. I was, I got really into, uh, building these little DOS games and, uh, doing, memory management in C++ and um, it was really fun and and I started doing some OpenGL programming and, and did a little bit of stuff in the Game Developers Club, Not, nothing serious, but that didn't last too, too long just because at the time, this was around like 2005, 2006, there weren't really a whole lot of great tools available for an independent game developer. Um, releasing on a console was nearly impossible uh steam was still kind of hitting its stride it wasn't really kind of the de facto games marketplace yet uh and the tools available to independent developers were 
almost non-existent. I mean, you're pretty much writing your own game engine. There was like one open source game engine that a lot of people used at the time and it was not that good. So, so that's why I kind of shied away from it uh, at the time. I was just like, this is too hard. I don't know how I'm ever going to get into this. Um, the resources for learning it were kind of like, hey, you read this big giant book and you can make a, a spinning multicolored triangle on the screen with OpenGL. And I said, like, great. Uh, I was like, nah. I And I discovered CSS and JavaScript. And I was like, this this is great. This has the immediacy that I'm looking for and the right. instant gratification of just typing something and seeing it work. Yeah, so. there's nothing that I hate more than a tutorial that will like finally teach me something I've been wanting to learn. But the end result is like some triangle or a yeah. or rectangle. And then yeah, I, can, yeah, yeah. I can color it. I'm like, that is... <laughs> <laughs> this, that seems like step one right yeah. <laughs> you're like uh uh yeah no i i totally agree and so i uh i shied away from it did web development for many many years and um it was around uh around 2013 i was kind of keeping my eye on games i guess through Twitter and stuff. Um, I was, I never lost my passion for playing games. I've played lots of games. I've, I have, oh gosh, I, I've taken weeks off work to play through games because uh, I just want to play through them from beginning to end. Right. Um, in 2011, I went to Seoul, Korea to watch StarCraft tournaments for two weeks. Oh, wow. Like, like that wasn't a stop on the trip. That was, was the trip. The trip. Like, that was the purpose of the trip. <laughs> so so like I love games and uh it was around 2013 where I saw um you know the Unity game engine started to really pick up steam at the time or, or uh pick up a lot of users and was getting a lot of interesting features um I saw the Kickstarter for the Oculus Rift happen uh and it was towards the end of 2013 where I was like you know I need to reassess this. Like, I still want to be in games in some capacity. Um, and I think maybe now, like almost 10 years later, uh, it might be the right time for me to jump back in and just, as kind of like a, not a low level programmer, but somebody with artistic and software interests. Um, so, uh, so my new year's resolution, December, 2013 was to make a video game. And so I set off in, you know, the first few months of 2014 and I thought I could complete it in about a year. And, uh, now I'm releasing that game in November, 2016 this year. So it actually took about three years. Um, not one. <laughs> that sounds like round target though, right? Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, for software. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, but I think the thing I grossly underestimated was just how much I had to learn. Um, oh, really? Because uh, the the thing I um, erroneously calculated in was that, well, I've worked on lots of large-scale applications before and lots of different types of websites and software projects. I was like, yeah, I can totally just handle a game and I'll just kind of learn it on the fly. Um, but it's amazing... Um, how many different topics there are to know uh, in making a game. It's it's highly interdisciplinary, just like making websites, really. And each one of those topics is incredibly deep. I mean, you know, you have graphics and game design and game audio and, you know, writing a compelling story and oh, all these things that are like you could spend a lifetime on and never truly master. Um, so I... Uh, it was it, it. My game actually started out as like a side scroller. I thought I'd make like a simple two D side scroller, kind of like I don't know Super Mario Brothers or something like that. And um, I I got this idea of like having this little uh, submarine kind of navigate through a cave system, and you'd have to kind of shine your your floodlights into the right direction to to see stuff. Right, and that's and that has like, I uh, just think about that. Just like that it sets a mood, already yeah. sets a tone. Uh, yeah, like you don't, you don't know what's going on. It's 
you kind of put the users uh, on edge a little bit without even going that far in the story, right? That's just... Exactly. I mean, and, you know, I, I picked a side scroller in 2D graphics just because I thought that would be something that would be maybe a little bit easier and more tractable as a project. Um, but then uh, I saw that VR was really starting to, uh, it looked like it was really going to take off. Um, it was really getting some traction. And I was like, you know, if I'm just starting out in this and just starting a game right now, I should try to shoot for like the bleeding edge of what's really possible. Um, and, and so I got uh, I, I ordered my Oculus DK one, uh, development kit, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I was immediately like blown away. I was like, okay, yep, let's just throw out this whole side scroller idea completely. <laughs> um, and what ended up happening is I, I took some of the ideas for the game and turned it into like this um, this 3D VR game um, where you, you are uh, you're in a deep sea dive pod and you're sort of navigating the the ocean and looking for cool wreck sites. I didn't, I didn't really have a much of a concept for the game at that point, but I knew that, that I wanted that to be the setting. Um, just cause I, I thought it was interesting. I hadn't really seen a deep sea adventure game yet. And I wanted to do that. So, um, the thing that I noticed about VR right away and all, all of the demos I was trying was that, uh, there was a pretty deep emotional connection with the medium that I had not seen before, uh, in other mediums. And it, it was a lot more than just like, uh, like a 3d movie or something like that, because you get sensory deprivation in the same way you do when you like put on really nice headphones or something. It's, it's like headphones for your eyes almost, you know? And so it completely covers your, your peripheral vision and you can look around in 360 degrees and um and the other thing about vr is that you can see in stereo 3d and it turns out that, that has a pretty powerful psychological effect because a lot of our um a lot of our psychology is tied to binocular depth cues because when you're you know uh, when you're a cave person running from a saber-toothed tiger, you need binocular depth to uh, judge the size and distance of various threats, right? Um, so for those reasons, uh, when you see in stereo 3D, you can, um, you can feel a lot more uh, of a range of emotions. So I think everybody's familiar with videos of people like freaking out when they're in VR because they're playing some kind of a horror game. Uh, and that's what goes viral on YouTube. But the same types of, uh, you know, there, there's a whole range of emotions that you can tap into, right, that uh, can have the same kind of powerful effect. Uh, so anyway, I noticed that and right away I was like, yeah, I need to create some kind of narrative game here okay. i, I want to do something that's really gonna hammer on emotions um because i think this you know i i felt like vr could connect with people in a way that uh, no other medium really could so yeah and then uh, the uh the trailer is out uh you have a trailer for a game and yes, uh, it is. i was really impressed with the trailer i was uh in terms of the story of it, like the uh, woman comes, you know, I, I, to, we'll rehash it for you. You already know the story, but basically, just, uh, <laughs> just from what little, I'll just tell a little bit of it, and then uh, a woman comes back to work in deep sea exploration, right? And is looking for wrecks, I guess, or looking for metal, uh, and her, um, she's talking to her boss, and her boss says, right. "Like we miss your mom. Uh, she's yep. an asset." And she's like, well, I'm really, and she cuts, cuts him off and says like, well, I'm just really here for the money pretty much. And like, yeah. and, and then that's like, okay, yeah, sure. Let's, you know, get, get back to it. And then, uh, and I felt like, wow, that sets a really great stage. You set a really great table with that. Cause you're also looking at, uh, the deep sea settings and, 
and uh, the nice the, the great graphics and stuff like that. So I was just like, wow, Thanks. this is this is really, uh, uh, yeah, this is if this is not your first game, I like, oh, this is a really great first game. I thought if this is. Thanks. Yeah. No. I mean, I so I've done a few little things here and there in uh, various game jams, which are kind of like. I don't know, a more familiar term to the web community might be hackathons. So it's basically like you make a game in 24 to 48 hours and um, it's usually the results are pretty hilarious because you can't make a game in 24 to 48 hours. I mean, you can, but you have to be very creative and make some pretty severe cuts to what you do. So um, at they're very much a trial by fire. I love doing game jams just because, you know, you always end up in these uh, situations where you're doing something you're not comfortable doing. It's way outside your comfort zone. So like in one game jam, like I just happen to like, I'm not an audio expert by any means. I just happen to know um, the audio system within the unity game engine. They're like, all right, you're doing audio for today. So I'm like, Great. Like I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I learned a lot in those two days. You know, it was um, so like if anybody's listening, looking to make games, I highly recommend doing game jams because it's um, such a great way to just dive right in and learn. Like you'll learn whether you want to or not. <laughs> you're you're going to learn stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than game jams this is my first game um and i think part of it comes from just playing a lot of games and wanting to make games for a long time and um i do have a few friends in the film industry like when i when i was first going into school i thought i wanted to do film and that lasted for about i don't know three to six months where i was like uh, I, I don't want to move to los angeles and do the hollywood thing for 10 years so that I can maybe someday direct Scooby-Doo five or something, you know, like I, I don't, like <laughs> it's, it's really brutally hard. And, um, but I, I have a lot of friends that, that did do that, you know, and they, um, and now they're actually starting to work on really cool stuff. Uh, and so I, um, I guess part of it comes from that kind of mindset of thinking about, um, thinking about games in terms of a, a narrative medium. Yeah. And then, um, sorry, brother, my call. You're right. You're <laughs> sorry. right. Um, yeah. So, and you're so close to be done. Is that right? Or are you? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah. So, uh, I don't think we've said the name of the game. So the, the oh, game yeah. has, <laughs> the game sorry. is called Neptune flux mm -hmm. and, uh, it's a deep sea adventure game releasing on November 15th. Uh, assuming no train wrecks happen. <laughs> um, it's always possible, but yep, everything looks good for November 15th. And it's, and, and it's a VR game, so it's going to be available on Oculus Rift. Is that right? Is that, uh, I'm not a yeah. VR person, so I have no idea. So like... No, 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 it's okay. So, so yeah, it'll be available for uh, Rift for HTC Vive. And it will also be available for PlayStation VR. And you can also play without a VR headset. Right. So you can play on PC and Mac through Steam, um, which is also how you play the, the Rift and Vive version. And you'll also be able to play just on a normal PlayStation 4 uh, with or without PlayStation VR. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. That's, that's pretty awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I know. I will say, like, I, my my boss. I'm not a big VR person, but uh, I think that's pretty awesome. Like, actually, build a game VR and also have a non VR VR version as well. That's pretty. That's pretty sweet. The future well, is awesome. I yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that was something I I designed from the beginning because, okay. and and there's no gameplay differences really. It's just kind of. It's sort of like the difference between watching a 2D movie and watching an IMAX movie. Right. You know, it's the same movie, um, but uh, you get kind of just a more enhanced experience, I guess. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to do that just because at the time that I started, it was very unclear how the VR market was really going right. to 
be uh, by the time I was finished, or if it would even ex still exist. Uh, it was impossible to really tell. So, um, so yeah, I, I wanted to make sure I supported flat gaming, as we call it, uh, <laughs> or traditional screens. Um, yeah. It's not really a good term for it yet, but yeah, but yeah. I, I bring my own bias to it because I remember uh, Vermal uh, markup languages for uh, uh -huh. for VR, and so that was I did some things for Vermal, and I was just that was so hard to do. Like you no, know, now I bet yeah, like the, the tools are way better now, and it's gotten a little bit better since then. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, I think. So. Things have improved. <laughs> I, 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 with uh, yeah, I hope so. But uh, well, the, but I do the, I love the idea of like Samsung with your your phone and we would. I love that the hardware's gotten smaller. Uh huh. Right? And, yep. um, I just wish it was smaller. <laughs> so that's. Well, it'll it'll get there. I mean, I think right now with VR, um, it's just getting started. It, it's hard, it's hard to draw analogies, really. But um, I think in terms of the technology, I like to compare it to things like voice recognition or touch screens, which kind of sucked for a long time, um, like touch screens in the 80s and 90s just like were not it just seemed like they never worked right um and i remember voice recognition being promised forever like flying cars and it's like yeah that'll never happen and, <laughs> and now finally you know the we it, it's commonplace you know right. we, have, we have our phones and digital assistants and it's it's a very normal thing um and i think vr falls into the same category it's one of those things that had this vision from like the 70s or 80s and the technology has ca finally caught up to that vision right. um, it's, it's finally reasonable to to do that and yeah i mean the obvious improvements are yeah of course it'll get higher resolution mm. the cost will come down the size and weight will come down um pretty normal tech stuff right. um but i think the big innovation is going to be what types of things we see in the new medium, because it's not just a peripheral like a like a gaming joystick or or a gamepad or something. It's it's a new platform. I yeah. think it stands uh, stands on its own, and and uh, I guess I, I would compare it to like the web or mobile as a platform. Oh. I think we could see a time uh, not too long from now where pretty much every business needs a VR presence of some kind. It's start, it's finding its foothold in gaming right now, but the applications stretch far beyond gaming. Um, same with augmented reality too, which are really kind of, they're different, but they're really all the same industry. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, I think just like how every web or, or every business needs a website and a phone app, um, it might not be long before every business needs some kind of a VR right. presence. Yeah, I could definitely get behind augmented reality a lot because I feel like, you know, even even a few years ago with uh, Yelp, with the monocle mm -hmm. the concept they had, like if you were walking down the street, you could actually like you know unlock monocle and you actually like see which businesses are nearby yep. and walk around. I feel like oh that's that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, because you're you're in control, but you also don't have like a, a Google Glass. Like things strapped to your head. So, yeah. But, so uh, the, I mean, the thing now with with augmented reality or or AR is that um, the the challenges involved are far greater than they are with with VR because you have to do um, well. It goes by a couple of names, but you have to do what's called inside out tracking or uh, SLAM, which stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, so that's the same thing that like self-driving car does. It's the same thing that the Mars rover does where you have to map your environment in 3D mm -hmm. and simultaneously localize yourself within that map and say, okay, I've made this map. Where am I in the map? And that way, you know, a self-driving car doesn't run into other cars. The Mars rover doesn't have to have commands issued to it to navigate around a rock. Like right. it can just yeah. do it and go in a kind of a straight line. Um, and for a, an augmented reality headset, you need to map that environment because you have to position the headset within that environment. Right. 
to have those 3D tracked objects look like they are locked in space. Um, and that it's, it's just as hard as it sounds. I mean, it, it's a very, very difficult problem. Right. Um, well, it's a problem that's been like, you know, as long as VR, like I, I, I can put up Vermal, right? Which is like mm -hmm. <clears throat> a number of decades. But uh, it's also a problem that's been worked on as well, like trying to find a soft moving uh, robot that's been worked on for several decades now. And, and I mean, you have like iRobot, Yep. Like you actually buy your robot and it actually like goes around your room. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't know your house at all until you like, turn it on. And even then, it'll forget. You know, your house what, what it looks like until if it turn if it turn if you turn it off. So, um, but yeah, I, I feel like you know, and with your phone having like the um, I forget what's called gyroscope or just to yep. being able to determine you know up and down and Pokemon Go. You know, just this. I think that's. Uh, I don't know. I feel like that's a really great success story. I mean, it was sure. It, it oh was, yeah, absolutely. it was it was crazy how big it is, but I don't know how how much it's dropped off since then. But uh, since the big explosion, but uh, but yeah, I feel like. Um, but but just not. I don't want you know. I don't think Pokemon's the quintessential example of AR, but I feel like it's. Um, but being able to to glean information on the go in your environment, I feel like that's pretty awesome. So. But. Yeah, I mean, it certainly represents a, a good example, yeah. I guess, for for people that are trying to figure out what AR might be useful for. Well, I mean, you can play games, and most people like games, so that's a, <laughs> that's a good example. Yeah, and that's not that's not bad. I mean, like the industry is awesome. I think it's pretty pretty wonderful. I mean, like just it dwarfs the the, the film industry. Yeah, so, it does. Yeah, so it just. I'm not. Uh, I don't want to shortchange that by any stretch of the I don't want to or get the pressure whatsoever. So, um, I just know I, I just feel like, like my my example has always been. I think it's probably, I'm a, I feel like I'm a broken record about this, but uh, I would love to have uh, my 3D uh, VR experience just be like the holograms in Star Wars. You know when, when like Darth Vader is talking to, to his uh, you know his admirals or whatever, and just right, right. Like, hey, I would totally like deal with that and have that be a cool gaming experience and just uh and just have that and then have that be a shared experience in a conference room like or or hang out with people in the living room and play games with, with a 3d hologram that'd be well cool. i mean it it's pretty close there there's some things in vr right now that you can you can play right now one one that i've been playing a lot is called rec room, rec room. and it's exactly what it sounds like it, it's a virtual rec room and you can go and play like ping pong with other people and yeah. You can you can chat with them. A lot of these VR headsets actually have a built-in microphone, mm -hmm. um, so you can just you know chat online. It's 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 interesting because you're seeing a lot of the same ideas that you might have seen in like Ultima or The Sims Online or Second Life, where you have this shared metaverse. But they're finally like again, it's it's a it's a case of the technology finally catching up to the vision, mm -hmm. where you're like, ah, okay, here's kind of the things we were imagining with our 2D pixels that, you know, we now have these real shared environments that feel, um, you know, a lot, a lot closer to the vision. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, there's tons of applications. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's an Ikea app where you can actually build a kitchen. Oh, wow. Um, there's, uh, you know, it, it's just amazing to see, some of the different applications that are are coming out of it that are non gaming. I think that's. I mean, I'm making a game, of course, but I'm definitely interested in non game applications just because I think that's really where it's going to find its foothold. There's a really cool one called Virtual Desktop, actually. That uh, I think, with just you know, slightly better pricing on the headsets, uh, better resolution. You know, I feel like we're just like a version or two away from a VR headset actually replacing a normal desktop computer. Yeah. Well, um, well what I love totally is the, uh, I, I think this is what it is, like the Samsung, you, you buy a Samsung phone and then you slap that into your your controller mm -hmm. and that your phone is powerful enough to be your visual display into the VR world. And so, and I feel like people will gladly carry and interface with their phone rather than like say pick up uh, the helmet or whatever and it's strapped down on their face if they if they put it on like a you know a frame for their phone 
Yeah. They'll mo- that's a more personal object, you know, that they, they, they take with them wherever they go. And they like, that's, that's more a casual input into a VR world. Yeah, like, totally. I mean, right now the, the hardware is kind of split between mobile VR, which is what that's called. Okay. Um, and the great thing about that is it's, it's VR you can throw in a backpack. I mean, you just need the headset and a phone and you, it's all wireless and, hmm. Um, the headset itself is so the Samsung Gear VR I think is only like a hundred dollars or something, and mm-hmm. then I mean of course you need the phone to go with it, but for most people that's kind of a sunk cost. So they already have the phone, um, so so that's a really attractive option. And then there's uh, I guess high end VR, right, which is like your your Oculus Rift, your HTC Vive. The things you get out of that are you know. Uh, much higher fidelity graphics. Um, they have positional tracking, which turns out to be really, really important in a lot of instances. So that means you can actually move your head and not just look around and rotate, but also move positionally. So you can like lean around a corner um, or look under things. And, um, and you know, they, they provide two different experiences. But I think for... You know, mobile VR is very attractive to developers because uh, because consumers look at the two options and they say, "Wait, so I can buy the wireless headset for ninety nine bucks and just use my phone, or I can buy a desktop computer and right. this expen this more expensive headset, and it has a wire. Yeah. Why would I do that? You know, and, and I mean, if you've tried both, like you know the difference. Right. And high end VR is kind of like what you want, but I think ultimately, like I said, I mean. It's, it's just like anything in technology. Like it'll become wireless. It'll become cheap. It'll probably, like, they'll probably become one and the same right. pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only gonna get smaller and smaller, and less wires. So totally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, I think it's a good time. How can people? Your game's coming out November fifteenth, or yep, November fifteenth. How can they find your game? Yeah. So. Well, if- if you just go on Steam and search for Neptune Flux, uh, it should be on there. You can also go to NeptuneFlux.com. Um, I mean, it'll, it, it'll also be on the PlayStation Network. Uh, so it doesn't have a store presence there just yet, but it should soon. But yeah. Okay. Just... And how can people find you elsewhere on the internet? So I'm, I'm on Twitter. I am at NickRP on Twitter. Uh, RP is just my middle and last name initial. Um, and yeah, I don't know. That's probably the best place to find me. I'm not, I'm not much for other social networks. I'm <laughs> mostly on Twitter. Right, yeah. cool. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Nick. This has been great. This has been yeah. awesome. Yeah, no problem. It's been fun. Right. And congratulations on the game. No. Thanks. That's awesome. Thanks. I'll, I'll take the congratulations when it's actually out. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> take a rain check on it. Okay. Yeah, thanks. We'll thanks. Do.